Patrick Beatty reviews the number one for news. It's Patrick Beatty reviews number one for news. Yeah. Tune in. Get up. Yeah. What's up? Keep the change, you filthy animal. Well, if you've ever had a hard time explaining to your kids what minutes were or about the phone that cornered 45% of the cell phone market, then BlackBerry should be on your radar. It's in theaters this weekend, and joining me today is the director and one of the supporting characters of BlackBerry, Matt Johnson. Welcome to The Daily Dish. Thank you for joining me. Oh, it's a pleasure. That was a great intro, Patrick. Great work. <laughs> Yes, nailed it. Well, I am so excited to talk to you about this. And number one, props for using a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle reference and then just doing a straight needle drop during the film. That was one of the first parts I was like, all right, I'm completely sold on this film and on your character who was hilarious in this movie. Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, you know, I, I've always been a huge fan of that 89 film. And I, I know it gets a lot of credit, but I just think people don't, general public, especially nowadays, don't give it the the respect it deserves. At its time, it was the most successful independent film film ever made, mm -hmm. and it, you've got the Jim Henson studio making these original turtle costumes. Like this, it actually is a pretty strong film. Amazing performance by Elias Coteus. Like mm -hmm. it's a it's it's more it's more than meets the eye. I will just say. <laughs> nice crossover. I, I I agree with you. It's probably it's one of the first superhero films that really took it seriously. Mm. And nobody gives it credit. It's always X Men or something like that. Or but, Batman. Well, Batman is. Or is, Batman is, too. Is what, is what gets the credit for that? Yeah. That's also awesome. Yeah, totally true. Um, so, in talking about BlackBerry, this is a story about kind of a hidden uh, Steve Jobs and Wozniak duo. Talk about what what your reasoning was for for wanting to explore these two characters and why BlackBerry was. Uh, were, did you own a BlackBerry growing up? What was the inspiration for that? No, I actually, in fact, it wasn't the technology. I, I never owned a BlackBerry. I never even really touched one before before I got to set. You you said it. It's this relationship between these two young men who don't realize that they are on the brink of discovering the future. And I, I so related to that as a, as a young filmmaker working with my friends, not really realizing that the work that we do could have an impact on other people. And I really, really related to that. Um, the fact that nobody knew who these guys were also, uh, I thought was a big bonus because it meant that I could, um, it meant that I could create characterizations that would really surprise people. And I love making films where the audiences don't really know what's real and what's not real. And so here was well, basically a perfect opportunity for that. Like a, like it's on its face, completely real story with characters who seem like way larger than life, but are grounded by their psychology, specifically the, the way it interacts, the three of them. Did you do any type of um, like deep dive research with them? Did you speak to any of them or was it really just like, I'm going to make my own creations over here? Well, yes and no. So no, we didn't have any contact with the real characters, mostly by design. We, uh, one, we're making this movie in relative secrecy. We were quite worried, believe it or not, uh, mm. early on that if the real guys found out we were making this movie, they would try to stop it. Oh, These no. are pretty powerful people in my country. I know now like it, it, that almost seems like a ridiculous thing to say, but it was a major concern as we were making the film. Mm. But in terms of our research... Yeah, we went to the ends of the earth trying to uncover just about everything we could about these guys. They're relatively, I would say, almost shy uh, uh, in terms of their public um, image. They did very few interviews. They aren't even really photographed too much uh, in, in public outside of like really big um, uh, like events. It, it, the media in my country, because these are Canadians, is not quite the same as in America. We don't have the same kind of hero worship like CEO worship in the media that that you guys have and so that meant that there was very little reporting on both the private lives of these guys and also just there, there wasn't as much interest and I think that was a real bonus because as you say it did mean that I could uh, I could interpret certain elements of their personalities in uh, in interesting ways but but more than that I love that this movie was going to be introducing people to characters that they had no baggage with unlike as you said a kind of steve jobs or even if somebody were to make a bill gates movie or uh the, like the social network with with zuckerberg it's like the audiences already have a, a preloaded conception of who these people are whereas this is, is just totally different when you were going to look for somebody to play jim i am so grateful that you were able to bring glenn howerton to the big screen and give him such a big role 
Um, what was it like approaching him for this? Was he was he at all concerned with it? Because it felt like a it felt like both a kind of a mirror to Dennis in some ways, but also a complete departure. Yeah, look, I knew seeing Glenn act that he could do something like this. I knew he'd be amazing. And it's so funny to say because, you know, the world knows him through this character that he's played for so long. And the character is got an intensity, but is is sort of mawkish in a way. And I would watch these these performances by him and I'd be like, this is so real. Like they're playing it for straight comedy and they're he's meant to almost be ridiculed, but like I believe in this guy. And so mm -hmm. when I approached him, it was basically with that pitch that I think that that you are going to be able to do uh, what you're so good at, except grounded. And we put you in the real world and you get to do all these things that uh, he's a Juilliard trained actor. You have to understand mm. really, yeah. really is serious about his craft. And and I thought, here's an opportunity for you to to use all of those tricks, um, except in the real world. And uh, and we were both really excited about that. Were there any notes at the beginning when you were talking about what your idea was of this person that maybe you wanted to like have him know and then just kind of go off with his own creativity? I'll put it this way. We didn't do any rehearsals. All we did was talk about the character. So we had all kinds of shared references. We, we discussed psychology deeply, what Jim wants, like what he thinks about, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but that conversation didn't end. We talked about that right up until we finished the film. Like that's so that was a daily conversation, R rather than talking about uh, like you saw the lines or or figuring out what scenes were about. It was much more interesting to figure out what we think Jim is about, and we mm -hmm. and we did that. we did that every day. So when it comes to Mike Lazaridis and his idea that quality was much better than quantity and outsourcing was just such a big problem, we're seeing apps like Wish up where you're getting things that are like ninety nine cents and like. Uh, a little bit of a shipping fee. Do you see that genie going back into the bottle anytime soon? Or, or do you think his point is pretty much drowned out now by just consumerism? It's a, it's a good question. I mean, obviously the market is just going to determine what they're willing to stand. I love this documentary crumb. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but it's about a cartoonist named R crumb who really bemoans the flight from quality that uh, American manufacturing has seen over the last century. Really? Um, maybe more so. Can it ever return? Well, let me put it this way. You look at an iPhone and you look at the design behind something like this. I mean, I'm talking to you on one right now. And I think if you were to hold that and use it and then to at the same time say, oh, wow, manufacturing standards have really gone down. You there's there's something there's something insincere about that because we're surrounded by absolutely phenomenally designed pieces of technology. Um, mm. uh, while at the same time, I do recognize that uh, there are certain products that have taken a nosedive and are made of the cheapest plastic and things are falling apart all the time. So, so I don't think it's as simple as saying everything has gotten worse or that things are constantly getting better. I wish that there was more bespoke worksman workmanship um, and that uh, when you like the thrill of going into like a knickknack store or whatever, or a toy store, you felt like, oh, my God, I'm getting something that is uh, that somebody really cared about when they made it. Maybe that's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. It almost seems as though for most products that that is gone, that the that the individual care of construction that Mike Lazarita is so represented and thought was so important and. Uh, really tried to make emblematic within the first uh, BlackBerry devices. That certainly seems like it, 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 uh, it may be gone. Is it coming back? I don't know. I mean, you look at websites like Etsy, you look at the sort of the homemade individual um, mm. uh, 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 product where it's like made to order. It, I don't know. It exists in, 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 in small corners of the internet, um, but will it ever become like a mass consumer movement again? I don't know. When it came to innovation and moving ahead with the trends, BlackBerry seems more like a cautionary tale. They did have an idea of what they wanted to do, um, mm. but it felt forced more than anything by by the board and what they were expecting. Do you see any parallel universe where BlackBerry did make it through? And what do you think would have need to happen for that? 
it's something I thought about post hoc. Uh, so I did not think about this as we were making the film because I was so invested in the present moment and and what these guys were dealing with at the time. But now that I've been able to watch the film and, and sort of think about what they did, I've come to a conclusion that I think is very related to the question you just asked about workmanship. And that is that when the iPhone gets released, BlackBerry, because they have like the majority market share, tried to go above Apple. They tried to say, well, we're the market leader. We're going to take what Apple's doing and we're going to integrate it into a product that's even better, right? We're going to have a, a BlackBerry that clicks when you press it, but it's also a single screen, a, a ludicrous product called the BlackBerry Storm. And I think now, as I look at what consumers are looking for, not everybody, but what some are looking for and what many people are talking to me about is that it seems as though people want devices that do less. It, there seems to be a thirst for a smartphone that can only send text me messages and take phone calls or can only send emails and send text messages. Like It's like a reduction of mm -hmm. applications is what people want. And it makes me think, oh, I wonder if instead BlackBerry had stuck to its fundamentals and gone underneath Apple and said, oh, Apple's going to go super big with many uses and, and, and basically be a new cultural uh, uh, device. Well, we're going to go even smaller and we're going to reduce the imprint of our, of our device. We're going to mm -hmm. take all of our apps out. We're not going to put a music player in it. We're just going to do email, phone, and text. And I can't help but think that if they had stuck to that and made a really refined, beautiful product, that they may still be a hardware company today. What was uh, one of the hardest scenes to shoot? You mean in terms of technically getting the camera to move the way we wanted it to move or? or... Uh, it could be that or it could because you're in front of the camera during a lot of it, too. I, I wonder if that was technically challenging as well. Uh, you know, I, I find it uh, uh, easier to act and, and make movies at the same time because it, it, uh, it just keeps me busy constantly and very engaged with the material. In terms of the most difficult thing that we shot, believe it or not, it's something I've never been asked. There are some singles, there's some long uh, uh, um, single steady cam sequences in the film yeah. that are very, very challenging to shoot just because we're on such a tight timeline. And, and then outside of that, there are some sequences where the cameras are so, so far away from the actors because we're shooting on such long lenses, like some of them, some, sometimes up to like 500 millimeter lenses, that getting precise close-ups and getting precise movements from that distance was was way harder than uh, than we had thought. Um, and so we spent so many takes just like losing focus, whatever, because we're doing it all on the fly. And I, I try not to block the actors too much. Um, so there were some moments, especially in the third act of the film, where that where that was a big, big challenge. But to be, to be honest, there was no single like, oh, my God, this is really way too hard. What was it like kind of bouncing some stuff off of Glenn Howerton, kind of getting that full rage in some situations? Um, I, I'm personally a huge fan of It's Always Sunny, so I'm sure that was a little bit like, oh, no, what's happening? The Golden God's here. <laughs> uh, well, I got to say, in terms of uh, his presence on set, that was really important because Glenn made made the conscious decision to be extremely serious all the mm, time. Right. Uh, even when we weren't rolling. And that really did give him a presence and that presence affected not just me but it affected the other engineers in the room and that was so useful because i mean those scenes that you see at the beginning of the film where he shows up and all of those other guys are like afraid of him like that was coming from a place of reality we didn't know him like he was a stranger he's a big american superstar and uh and yeah he gave us that gift of uh of um of playing that role so so i was very very grateful for that and in terms of me trying to be funny with him i gotta be honest like we did not think what i was doing was funny on set <laughs> like that, that kind of stuff only becomes funny afterwards in the edit mm. like, no one was laughing well hey matt it was absolutely a pleasure getting to talk with you blackberries out in theaters this weekend please go check it out and uh, thank you so much for joining the daily dish hope to see you again soon Thank you.